As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and dear friend, I've been waiting for you. And today we're going to continue our series, which is called How to Open the Window of Heaven Over Your Life, What the Bible Really Says About Giving. This series comes in different formats. It comes in five parts, and it comes with a wonderful study guide. And my friends, you need to know how to open the window of heaven over your life and that's what this series is about. And right now we're also offering you my book, which is called A Life Ablaze. The subtitle says, 10 Simple Keys to Living on Fire for God. So many people begin on fire, but they seem to lose the fire along the way. What can you do to make sure you remain a life ablaze all the way to the end of your life that's what this very practical book is about. It's about the 10 fuels that you need to be injecting into your fire so you remain a life ablaze. Order yours today by going online or by giving us a call. And remember that when you become a partner with our ministry, we're going to send you two books as our way of saying welcome to our partner family. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, verse 21, that the lips of the righteous feed Many, what a privilege that we can feed many people the Word of God. And I can sit in this chair and do my part, but our partners put financial fuel into the tank so we can take the program to people all over the world. And I just saw a list of where people are calling and responding to, and friend, they're really responding from all over the world. We're bringing teaching that people can trust to all over the world, and what a privilege that we can do it with our partners. And a partner is anyone who regularly financially gives into our ministry. And the moment you become a partner, we're going to send you two books, my book called Life in the Combat Zone, which is dedicated to our partners. And we're going to send you Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness. And if you're already a partner, I want to say thank you. And if you're becoming a partner today, I say welcome to the family. And hey, if you have any prayer need on your heart right now, something that you're facing that seems pressing or something that's weighing you down, give us a call or send us an email because we would love to pray with you. And the moment the phone rings or the moment your email shows up in our inbox, we're going to release our faith for Jesus to do something magnificent on your behalf. So let us know how to pray for you. But I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Reach for your Bible, and today we're going to go to Malachi chapter 1, but I want us to begin with our anchor verse, which is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, where Jesus remarkably said, for where your treasure is there, will your heart be also. And the word where in Greek means exactly there where your treasure is. The word treasure is the Greek word thesaurus. It describes a treasure, money, riches, investments, resources. So Jesus is where the cash is, where your money is, where you put your resources, there will be your heart also. And the word there in Greek is the word K. It means exactly there. And in this verse, Jesus teaches that money really reveals our heart. If you want to know where your heart is, just follow your money. If you want to know where the heart of anybody is, follow their money, because money tells the truth. One man said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And it's the truth. And when you love someone, you invest in them. When you love the kingdom of God, you invest in the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus now says in this verse. For where your treasure is, that's the great revealer, there will your heart be also. But one of the most important texts about giving is found in Malachi chapter 1. So let's go there and we're going to begin in verses 7 and 8. And in these verses, we find that God is listening to his people. He hears what we say to one another. He even hears what we privately think. 
And when you come to these verses, God quotes what he has heard his people saying. Listen to what it says, Malachi chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. You offer polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. What does that mean? They were saying, Ugh, we're so tired of giving. And we're so tired of hearing about giving, giving, giving. Ugh, the table of the Lord, it is such a drudgery. We're so tired of this. They were calling it contemptible. And it goes on to say, and if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? Or I would paraphrase it like this. Your offerings are a stench to me because of the attitude you have when you offer them. In fact, by offering your sacrifice with such resentment, you've contaminated my altar. You're giving me defective rejects, the blind, the lame, the sick animals. When you could be bringing me the best, try to offer that to your governor and see if he'll be pleased with you. And yet that is what you're offering me. The Israelites were offering God their leftovers that they didn't want. These were not real sacrifices. They were just cleaning their inventory. They were not bringing God the very best. These sacrifices cost them nothing, and God knew that. God did not need their animals, but God wanted their hearts. And the way that they were bringing their gifts revealed that their hearts were not right when it came to the subject of giving. And in Malachi chapter 1, verse 10, God rebuked them and he said, Who is there among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire upon mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure upon you, says the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering from your hand. Or I would paraphrase it like this, shut the door to my house and stop coming. If this is the way you're going to come, and if you're going to come with this kind of an attitude, please stay at home. I will not accept what you're bringing me because your heart is not right. The truth is God did not need anything from them. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to the Lord. The streets of heaven are made out of gold. The gates of heaven are made out of pearls. Heaven is filled with precious gems. What need does God have? He was not after their resources or their treasure, but he was after their hearts. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And by bringing inferior gifts, really just cleaning their inventory, bringing God what they didn't really want at home, they were revealing they had defective hearts. And when you come to Malachi chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But you've profaned it in that you say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible, which means they were just tired of bringing offerings to the Lord. And in verse 13, you said also, Behold, what a weariness it is. We're so tired of this. You've snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts, and you've brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, saith the Lord? It was the equivalent of saying, you're calling this an offering? These were very strong words from God because it was responding to a heart that was defective. It wasn't just a defective gift. The gift revealed the condition of their heart. So when you come to Malachi 3, verses 7 and 8, God tells them how to fix it. And he says, even from the days of your fathers, you're gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Now listen to this. Return unto me and I will return unto you. And here we find a principle of scripture that when we begin to move toward God, God begins to move toward us. We find the same principle in James chapter 4 verse 8, where James writes, draw nigh to God and God will draw nigh to you. But God is waiting for you to begin. And here we read that if we will come near to the Lord, the Lord will come to us. Or Malachi chapter 3 says, Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But they were asking, Wherein shall we return? How do we make it right? And God answers, Will a man rob God? But you've robbed me. That you say, wherein have we robbed thee? And God answers, in tithes and in offerings. 
I remember when Denise and I first got married and I had no faith for finances and I wasn't being obedient in the tithe or in my giving. When the pastor would read this verse, I hated it because I knew that I was robbing God. And Denise would even say to me, Rick, are we tithing? Are we giving? And I knew we weren't, but I didn't want to tell her that. So I would deflect by saying, how could you even ask me such a question? But the truth is we were not tithing because I didn't have a revelation about giving. And as a result, we were cursed in our lives. God didn't curse us. I put a self-imposed curse on our life because by not giving, I removed myself from the realm where God could bless me. And that's what we read as we continue in this text. It says in chapter three, verse nine, you're cursed with a curse for you've robbed me, even the whole nation. And in this verse, we find that when we take what we should be giving to God and we use it on something else, we remove ourselves from a place of financial blessing. The verse never says God curses. It does not say that, but it says by refusing to obey God's principles, we remove ourselves from the place of blessing that otherwise could be ours. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. It is the equivalent to saying, if you put in, you're going to get out. But what about a farmer who never puts any seed into the soil? Eventually nothing's going to be produced by the soil and he's going to be cursed because of his lack of investment. And in the very same way, when you do not release your finances into the kingdom of God, a day is going to come when you're going to run out of finances, you're going to be cursed. And it's not because God has cursed you. It's because you've not participated with the law of sowing and reaping. If you want to reap, you have to sow. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. If you're not sowing, then you're not going to have anything to reap and you're going to be cursed. And of course, this is what exactly happened to me and Denise in the early days of our ministry. We were cursed. And my friend, when I tell you we were cursed, I mean, we were living at such a low level. If you had seen Rick and Denise render back in those days, you would have been amazed that it was us. And not only were we cursed, we had friends that were cursed. None of us had a revelation about giving. One week I ran out of gas five times because I only had enough money to put $1 of gas into the tank at a time. I cannot begin to tell you how humiliated I was to call somebody five times from a pay phone because it was before the day of mobile phones to say, can you please have mercy on me and bring some gas to put in my tank five times in one week. Denise and I were just living low level lives. We were cursed. And the reason was I was not giving and a self-imposed curse came upon me just like this verse says. And my friends, God doesn't want any of his people to be cursed. And I would advise you that if you're struggling in your finances, before you deal with the devil, first look at your giving and ask, am I giving as I'm supposed to give? Am I currently having a deficit because I haven't been sowing? You need to fix that first. Then if you realize I've been sowing and I'm still having a problem, then you need to deal with a devil because my friends, you have the authority to tell the devil to move off of your finances. But when you come to Malachi chapter three, verse 10, God says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. Now listen to this and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts. Give me a chance to show you what I'll do. And then he says, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That's what God wants to do. He's not trying to get something from you. He's trying to get something to you. And my friend, what God wants to get to you is abundant. You can't even measure it. The verse says he will pour out a blessing so big there will not even be room to receive it. That is God's desire for you. But notice this verse says, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, the windows of heaven, what is the windows of heaven. Well, when you read the Old Testament, you find that the window of heaven appears three times in scripture. 
And to understand what God is describing in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, you have to go back and look at these other examples of the window of heaven. And the first time the window of heaven shows up in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 7 verse 11. Then it appears in Psalm 78 verse 23 and finally here in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Get ready for a revelation because you're about to find out what happens when the window of heaven opens. But let's look at the first mention which is in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, and the Bible says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the deep broken up, and listen, and the windows of heaven were opened. That is the first mention of the windows of heaven in Scripture. And when the windows of heaven opened, what happened? We know what happened because of Genesis chapter 7, verse 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. So much rain came pouring through that open window that the earth was flooded. Even the highest hills were covered. Rain poured and poured and poured and poured and poured. So the first time the windows of heaven opens in Scripture, something abundant comes pouring through it. Wow, it was miraculous, the level of abundance that came pouring through that open window. But the second time this open window appears in Scripture was when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and for two months they'd been walking through the wilderness. Now their food supplies were running low and they were complaining and they were murmuring about their situation. And in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, God said, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And manna began to come. And manna didn't just come, it amply came. And in fact, when you read Psalm chapter 78, verses 23 to 25, it says, God opened the doors or the window of heaven. There it is again. It's a door. It's a window. It is a heavenly portal, and God opened it. And when God opened the windows of heaven, what happened? The Bible says, And rained down manna upon them to eat, and man did eat angels' food. So the psalmist tells us in verse 23, The window of heaven was opened, and the result is recorded in verse 24. When it was opened, the manna began to rain and rain and rain and rain and rain down upon them. Just like when the window opened in Genesis chapter 7 and rain poured and poured and poured through that open window. Now the window is opened and this time manna is pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring so much manna, they did not have room to receive it. Isn't that remarkable? Now, when the manna first fell, it fell when the window opened. Then it began to fall and fall and fall and fall and fall. How much manna fell through that open window? Well, rabbinical literature says manna fell in such abundance every day that it spread out over more than 2,000 square cubits with a depth of 50 to 60 cubits. Let me tell you what that means. If that is the case, as the rabbis say, it means a single day's supply of manna. A single day's supply of manna. Would have been enough to feed the children of Israel for 2,000 years. Now maybe that explains the phrase that you will not have room to receive it. In one day, enough manna to feed them for 2,000 years. And rabbis have made a rough estimate of how much manna was actually needed. God gave far more than what they needed. And the rabbis have estimated that if there were 3 million Jews, then they needed approximately 4,500 tons of manna every day. And if it fell, as the Bible says, for 40 years, it means at the end of those 40 years, if you added it all up, it was 65,700,000 tons of manna. Now, my friends, that's a lot of manna. Just imagine if you woke up in your city tomorrow morning 
and 4,500 tons of freshly baked bread were laying all over the city. You could just run out of the house and pick it up and bring it home and eat it. It would be such a sensation. The scientists would fly in from around the world. News stories would cover it. They would begin to look at it and examine it. What is it? Where did it come from? That happened with the children of Israel consistently for 40 years years, an entire generation of children grew up in the wilderness thinking it was normal to wake up and miraculously find 4,500 tons of manna laying on the ground. They were born when it was happening. They saw it for 40 years. They didn't know life without this supernatural provision. That's what happened when the window of heaven opened over the children of Israel. So now we've seen two examples. Number one, Genesis chapter seven, the portal of heaven opened and rain poured and poured and poured enough to flood the entire earth, even covering the top of the tallest mountains. Number two, in the wilderness, the window of heaven opened and manna poured and poured at least 65,700,000 tons of manna. Now keep all of that in your mind and let's return to Genesis where God says, if you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, prove me now here with says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing so huge that you will not have room to receive it. My friends, this means we need to upgrade our believing rather than say, God, I'm giving so that you'll meet a little need in my life. Lord, if you could just give me fragments, God is wanting to fill the table till it is overflowing. God is wanting to open the window of heaven over your life to such a degree that you will not have room to receive everything that he wants to give. And we need to renew our minds to what God wants to give us. But wait, there's one more promise. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 11, God says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, which means when we open our hands to give, God opens his mouth. Wow. When you open your hand to obey God with your finances, God opens his mouth and rebukes the devourer for our sake. God literally says to the devil, move off of that person. That person is a generous giver. Just move off of them and move off of them right now. And friend, I'm going to tell you, when God opens his mouth and speaks to the devil, the devil moves. But in these remarkable verses in Malachi chapter one and chapter three, we find first of all, that God's listening to us. He knows our heart condition about our giving. He tells us how to return to him and how to make it right. He tells us to bring a generous offering into the house of God, and he will open the window of heaven over our life, pour out a blessing so huge, we won't even know how to contain it all. And he'll open his mouth and he'll tell the devil to move off of our lives. All of that belongs to to those who generously give. Remember, God is generous with the generous. And God wants you through your own giving to open the window of heaven over your life. That is amazing. I'll be back in just a moment and I want to pray for you. What does the Bible really mean when it says God will open the windows of heaven over the lives of those who are givers? And how do you know if the windows of God are closed or open over your life? Rick Renner says, Years ago, I didn't understand how vital it was that I sowed into the kingdom of God. And as a result, Denise and I lived sad financial lives. But a day came when the Holy Spirit showed me the powerful results that take place when you become a regular giver. The day Denise and I began to give, we discovered the key that opens the window of heaven. In this series, How to Open the Window of Heaven Over Your Life, Rick covers that God is generous with the generous, how God responds to sacrificial giving, how to open the window of heaven over your life, what Jesus said about giving, what the Apostle Paul said about giving. Available in digital or physical format starting at just $10, this series will be a blessing to anyone who is ready to enter a new realm of the abundant life. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the book, A Life Ablaze, for $18. In this powerful book, Rick lays out everything you need to stay on fire with the Holy Spirit's power for years to come. Don't miss this special offer. Order the series, How to Open the Window of Heaven Over Your Life, and the book, A Life Ablaze. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now.
Hey friends and partners, this is Rick Renner. You can probably see my breath because it's minus nine here right now, but I'm standing in the new building for our Moscow TV studio. And I wanna say thank you to you for all of your sacrificial giving, for being a part of our giving team. Phase one enabled us to construct this building and it is completely paid for, the building itself, the windows, the doors, all the way to the roof, even the heating system. And in phase one, we were enabled to purchase our building in Tulsa and now we have secured it. But now in phase two, we need to finish the interior of this building. We can't move into it the way that it is today. But my friends, in a very short time, we're going to have cameras working in this building and from this location, we're going to be sending teaching that people can trust to the ends of the planet. And the focus of phase two is finishing this facility. And as I told you before, it's not about buildings. It's about having a building so that we can create programming that will change people's lives. And I'm asking you to please pray about being a part of the giving team to finish phase two, which is completing the interior of this building. And I promise you, we will be so careful with every penny and every dollar you give. We understand the value of money. And we're going to pray for God to magnificently and massively multiply your giving back to you again. Thank you so much. Please become a part of our giving team to finish phase two as we complete the interior of the Moscow TV studio. My friend, today we have covered a lot of material in my brand new series called How to Open the Window of Heaven Over Your Life what the Bible really says about giving. And we've seen that our generous giving is the key to unlock the lock to the window of heaven. And when we bring a generous gift to God, it literally opens the window of heaven so God begins to pour miraculous abundance into our life. Father, help us to upgrade our faith to understand and to embrace what you want to pour into our lives. But anyway, it's all in this wonderful series. You need to hear it and hear it and hear it. And my friend, it comes with a study guide so that you can read all of it while you're listening to it or while you're seeing it. And remember that right now we're also offering you my book, which is called A Life Ablaze, 10 Simple Keys to Living on Fire for God. God wants you to start on fire and end on fire. You need to know the right fuels to be injecting into your flame so that you remain a life ablaze. And that's what this book is about. And my friends, you can order all of these by going online or by giving us a call. And remember that if you need prayer, we're waiting for the phone to ring right now or for your email to show up in our inbox. But Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, help us to really see what you want to do in our life. You're not wanting to give us crumbs. You're wanting to fill the table. And Lord, help us to upgrade our faith to see it and to embrace it. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you tomorrow, but remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. If you enjoyed that teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.